new to the Master League and want to know what it's all about. Maybe you've played it before but you want a bit more of an in-depth guide into some of the intricacies of the game. And maybe you're an expert in Master League but I'm pretty sure I've still got some good tips that will suit everyone. Also if you guys have got any tips feel free to share them down in the comments below. I suppose the first question is what is the Master League? The Master League is a single player career mode within Pro Evolution Soccer, previously known as ISS or International Superstar Soccer, and as of recording it's been proposed to be released in eFootball 2023. Today we will be focusing on PES 2021, but a lot of these guides and tips will actually translate to previous versions of the Master League, and hopefully the future version which will be in eFootball, fingers crossed. Now in all versions of PES you didn't actually get a choice of who you start with, you could choose the team but not the actual lineup. In more modern versions you've got a choice at the start. In PES 2021 you do have the option to start with a club team lineup, all this means is that you'll be starting with the actual players that are in that squad at the club. So if you start with Man City for example, you would have the likes of Edison and Goal, Kevin De Bruyne, if you choose to start with a Master League original lineup, no matter which team you pick you will start with a squad of made up players basically a bunch of misfits that you come to know and love. And this is where you get to choose your team. In this version of PES 2021 I do actually have a patch so it may look slightly different for you. But let's say today I'm going to choose my favourite team, my hometown club of Newcastle United. You can choose the appearance of your manager, it doesn't really make any difference. You can change your player's name, where they come from and what they look like. And onto some of the basic settings when you start Master League, we'll go through them one by one. Transfer frequency is exactly as it sounds, it just depends how many transfers are going to go through in those transfer windows. Negotiation difficulty, fairly straightforward again, this covers actual signing of players, which is twofold. So it's actually the accepting of the transfer offer by AI Club, and also the player themselves accepting the contract. Now whether that's you're signing a player, or you've got a player and you're looking to sign a new contract with him. You can change the budget that you start with, but this also affects future transfer updates that you get in different transfer windows. Salary display does not affect any actual gameplay, it just affects the UI. Just choose whatever is your preference, would you rather see weekly wage or a yearly wage? The next two settings actually affect the match itself, so what difficulty would you want to play on and how long are the matches? Again for a bit of UI, what sort of currency do you want it to be displayed as? And how often would you like to be stopped in the transfer window? Just when there's an update in negotiations or scouts found a new player? Do you not want to be stopped at all? Every day, which can be a little bit slow going, but it gives you more control over the transfer window or every five days, but bear in mind that this won't stop if there's an update in negotiations, it will just go the five days. And don't worry too much, some of these settings can be changed once you start the Master League. If you go over to the right in System, go down into General Settings. As you can see, the majority of these settings can be changed once again. So let's have a look at these misfits then. Go into My Team Info, go into Squad List, and we can see who we've got. Even if you're not a Newcastle fan, I'm sure you can see that this is not the Newcastle squad. And like I say, no matter which team you pick, you will start with all of these players if you select the default squad. Now, if you are a bit of a PES enthusiast and you've played some of the old games, you will see that this traditional lineup is not the same as some of the previous ones. And they have changed a little bit over the years, but I still remember back in the old PES days when you had the likes of Costolo up front, Ivarov in goal, Minanda is the creative number 10, and the absolute unit of streamer in defense. Personally, I like starting with this squad because I think it gives a little bit more of a challenge, well, a lot more of a challenge, actually. You can make the team fully your own, and if you do finally get around to winning that Champions League, it just makes it all the sweeter. You can view your squad in several places. Squad list is what we were just looking at before. Training and skill training will show what plan your players are currently on. There's also a section in negotiations where you can see the contracts of your players, which we'll have a look at later, and the game plan itself, which we'll look at now. And in here, you can make any alterations to your starting 11, what substitutes you have, the actual formation and settings of your squad, free kick takers, captains, and any other tactics. And this is the sort of formation I normally go in with, although that can be mixed up. And we'll actually quickly flip over to my current squad that's playing in the Master League. And of course, this will look different because this is a few seasons of progress. But I like to start with a back four with the wing backs being pretty wide and pushed forward a little bit. I do like to play 4-3-3. I normally have the midfield three fairly central. I may play one defensive midfielder and two attack midfielders, potentially two centre midfielders and attack midfielder. You can mix those up quite a lot. And when you're buying players, which we'll move on to later, it's good to get players that can slot in multiple positions. Up front, I like to have one centre forward and two wide players. Now, normally I would choose inverted wingers. And for those that don't know, what is an inverted winger? 
So a traditional winger would have his favoured foot to be the same side he's playing. So a right winger, his stronger foot would be his right foot. Left winger would have his favoured foot as being left. I personally prefer the inverted winger tactic, which is just the opposite. So you could swap these around. So your right winger would have a left foot and your left winger would have a right foot. This all depends on your style of play. For me personally, I like this option because my centre forward can take the ball, hold it up, lay the ball off to one of the wingers who can then cut inside and have a shot on goal. The benefit of having traditional wingers is they can run down the lines and put in a great ball with their stronger foot. Now, if you had someone that had very good weak foot accuracy and usage, they can be very useful on the wing because they can either cut inside or they can go down the flank and put in a ball. In my current squad, I currently have the likes of Martinelli playing on the left as he's a right footer. He's great at cutting in, having a great shot. And the likes of Messi, who is a regen in my game, which we'll discuss a little bit later on as well. But he'll often play on the right hand flank, cut inside and have a shot with his left foot. But you can mix things up. You can also change these wingers into second strikers. Any of those central three, you can change into centre mid, defensive mid or attack mid. But it's up to you. Go with a formation that you're comfortable with. When you're starting out, you may want to just favour what sort of players you've got and build the formation around your strongest players. But I would suggest deciding on a formation that you want and buying players or bringing up players from the youth squad to suit that formation. And the benefit of that is if you know your formation inside and out, you know where your players are going to be. And also the team chemistry, which you can see in the top right is currently 46. Generally your team chemistry will be higher if you keep the same formation. And so just jumping back into our current lineup that we're looking at here with Newcastle United and the default squad. In the player settings you've got the likes of captain so you can pick a captain. Now there are some team roles that players can pick up further down the line or may already have them and being a captain may be a subject of one of those team roles. You can also pick your long and short free kick takers, your corner takers and your penalty kick taker although these can all be changed in game on the fly. So we did just mention the team role, so let's have a look at that now. So if you go on my team info, go to the team role list. Now with the default squad, there's not going to be many players with a team role. It may differ depending on what team you pick and whether you start with the standard lineup or the default lineup. And I'm not going to go through every team role, but as you can see, you get an overview of which players currently have the role. Down below on the bottom right, there are players that are in line for the role, so they don't have it yet, but they could get it soon. In the bottom left you can see the team role effect so this just shows you what sort of effect it has on your finances the condition of either that player or potentially other players the growth of that player or again potentially other players too and the effect on team spirit and if you flip over the page on these ones you'll see what actually effect it has so rising star which arcas has gives him more experience per match it makes him upgrade his skills quicker the chances for development spike are higher and any transfer offers received are likely to be higher too. And as you can see, there are many, many different team roles and the star quality just increases the positive effects I suppose it has on your team. So if you look at Legend here, it has lots of basic effects. You get extra money, condition is boosted for matches, train effects are boosted for players in the same position as that player. So if he's a centre forward, any other centre forwards in that squad will have a better effect in terms of training. When they play, the team spirit is higher. And this is the ones where some of their roles have captain specific elements. So if you've got a Legend and you select them as a captain the team spirit will increase but it will also increase their xp for other players i suppose the next question is how do you get these roles well players that you currently have will just develop these over time not everyone but obviously if you've got high quality players they may develop these roles and they can transition from one role to the other so arcas has rising star that doesn't mean to say in the future that he could potentially change into a playmaker for example when you're buying players you can even see what roles they've currently got and you can search for these via negotiations so if we go into advanced search here you can actually select team role and you can select any of these to search for players with these roles so if you're looking for someone very specific you could actually try and sign a player that's already got this quality we will have a look at transfers and contract negotiations soon but for now let's focus on training and skill training first of all within team management you go down to training this will show your current squad and what training plan they're currently on and with pretty much any screen where there's players you can scroll through to see what all of their stats are what their skills are any team roles they've got and also their expected development now for me this development graph is one of the key pieces of mastery that you need to look at not only when you're signing new players but when you're looking at your current squad now castle dean here is 20 he's probably just about but turned 21 as you can see 72 overall rated and that graph just shows from left to right what is his expected growth now it doesn't necessarily stick to that if you play a lot more matches and have good ratings that can often be increased we'll have a look at another player here so Gyoza he's 19 or 20 years old currently 69 rated 
good number. His increase looks slightly on a higher weight, probably because he's a bit younger. And on the negative side, we've got a 35-year-old goalkeeper here who is on the decline. Now again, if you play him often enough and he has good ratings, you may be able to stop that decline somewhat, but eventually players will start losing some of their stats. But within this training settings, you can actually select what sort of training path they're going to go on. We'll have a look at balanced first. This is the one that you'll see a lot of players on, and it just means that there's equal weighting into every single one of the stats to potentially increase. So in theory, those players will get the same amount of XP in each stats. Now, obviously, they will level up quicker or slower depending where they are. The higher the stats go, the more XP it takes to level up again. And depending what position that player plays in will determine what sort of training settings they can select. For example, a goalkeeper, they can only select balanced, offensive goalkeeper or defensive goalkeeper. Every player has the option to select focus training where you can put up to five stats in different settings and this will upgrade those accordingly. However, looking at a center forward, as you can see, very different options. You've got goal poacher, dummy runner, I'll not go for them all. They each offer you different alternatives in terms of what stats are going to increase. So you can see on the right hand side, if we look at goal poacher, their acceleration is going to be one of the key stats that increases. Whereas something like target man focuses on physical contact, jump, heading. So someone traditionally that you're put the ball in the box as a cross, expect him to get on the end of it with his head. So the question is, what training setting should you pick? Well, there's a few factors to consider. First of all, the player themselves, but also what sort of style of play do you actually play and what formation are you currently using? Let's use Arcas as an example. Now, Arcas for me is one of the best default players you can get. He's young, he can improve, he's a second striker, but he's very good in attacking midfield and he can play in centre midfield as well. I personally would probably pick creative playmaker for him. So that's going to increase his offensive awareness, his range of passing, his dribbling. And some of those stats are already very good. So you're just improving some of his key stats. But there's another option to consider. What happens if instead of improving his stats that he's good at, you want to create a more all-round player and maybe focus on some of his weaker stats instead? There's nothing to stop you using some of the training settings that you wouldn't necessarily associate with that player. So Arcas is certainly not a target man, but you could use that to increase his finishing, his heading, his jump, his balance. All stats you would say are probably on the low end for this player. Or you could go a more direct route and have a look at focus training. For example, want a more of a sort of box-to-box -box midfielder? Maybe pick shooting and defense in some of his focus training and eventually end up with a more rounded player. Now, of course, there are pros and cons to both sides. Creating a more all-rounded player and leveling up weaker stats is actually a little bit quicker because, you know, the lower the stats are, the quicker they upgrade. However, this can lead to players that are decent in a lot of areas, but not spectacular in any. We could focus on the stats that are already good and create them to a very, very good attacking midfielder, number 10, get that passing and dribbling way up there. And you can create a specialized player that is very good at a couple of things, but maybe weaker in others. And again, this depends on the position they're playing. So I would say wingers, you may want to specialize in. Center forwards, you may want to do that. Central defensive midfielders, you may want to have a more all-round player. And there's nothing to stop you using this for a few weeks, a few months to increase those stats up for the player and then switching to a different training setting after you've done that. Now you can do exactly the same with your youth squad, exactly the same process, but we will have a look at the actual youth element later on. For now, we're gonna focus on skill training. So players can actually develop skills. They may already have some as well. These can either be what I would consider skill moves or more sort of contextual skills. So I'd say the top nine here are skill moves, ones that you pull off by pressing certain buttons in a certain combination. For example, the only one that I really use is the cut behind a turn, which is if you go to shoot or cross, so square or circle, but then you hit X before they shoot, they'll do a little sort of feint. But then you move on to further down the list in terms of contextual skills. So skills that you're not actively trying to pull off, they're more sort of improvements for how a player forms a certain action. For example, Mihailov here is eligible for heading. Now, if he gained this skill, his heading accuracy would improve and he's more likely to do downward headers rather than head them over the bar, which is what I frequently do. And I'm not actually gonna go through all of the skills, you can have a look through them yourselves, but they do cover a range of positions, even goalkeepers, and there's even specific captaincy related skills too. Now, one of the most important things, you could only train one player at any one time in a skill. So you have to pick carefully. And when you hover over any of the skills, it will show you if you've got any eligible players. So in this case, heading, Mihailov is the only player that could currently train in heading. Now, the reason for that is players do need certain requirements met before they can train in a skill. So to gain the heading skill, you already need to have at least a heading of 80 or higher and a physical contact of 80 or higher in the stats. So Mihailov is the only player that I've got stats in those two cases, higher than 80, and they don't have the heading skill already. Understandably, if a player's already got that skill, they will not appear in the eligibility for that specific skill. 
So let's have a look at heading. So we've selected heading. If there was multiple players, we can then select which player we want to choose. Now Mihailov doesn't actually have any skills at the moment, but it's very important to know that there are a maximum of 10 skills that a player can hold and you can't sort of forget or remove any skills. Now in this case, Mihailov doesn't have any, so don't have to wait. So we're going to pick heading. And as you can see now, it says eligible players Mihailov brackets in training. So that's currently in progress. Training period is 45 days. He's obviously got 45 days remaining because we haven't progressed time yet. So at this stage, you can't train any other players. You can cancel this. And for example, say if he had trained 15 days, so he only had 30 days remaining, you could change to a different player and a different skill, and this would stop. And if you go back to this, it will still have trained those 15 days. You don't actually lose the training that you've already done. So for example, I want Arcas to now learn this Scotch move instead. So I'm going to select that. I'm going to say yes to suspend the current training. I will select Arcas. And as you can see now, Arcas is in training. Now we did mention something earlier in the team roles that Arcas had something which made training take less time. So as you can see, I've only just selected this training and that normally takes 30 days for this specific skill. But for Arcas, it only takes 20. Now over time, as your players progress, you're gonna get more players that are eligible for skills. I would say focus on the players you're likely to keep. Focus on the younger players if you can. Although if you do train a player in a skill, they're probably gonna be more profitable if you do decide to sell them. So now we're going to look at the negotiation side, but we're going to start with the youth team squad, which technically sort of falls under that bracket. If we go in team management and negotiations, and as you can see in the bottom right is the youth team. Now within the youth squad, it looks very similar to the normal squad. You can do the usual sort of filter by overall rating. So maybe I want to filter in ascending order. So the youngest players at the top. So within the youth squad, you can decide to sign a player pretty much at any time and it won't cost any sort of transfer fee, but it will affect the salary budget. So if I look at Hamden, he is 20 years old. He's got very good weak foot usage and accuracy, and he's already developed some orange stats, which is a good start for a young player. For me personally, Bajer is one of the best players that I've found in the youth squad. As you can see, weak foot, accuracy, conditioning, injury resistance, all the highest they can go. He's only 17 years old. He's obviously on the up in terms of development. So why don't we go ahead and sign Bajer? With any signing, you do get this confirmation box and you can also only negotiate with five players at any one time. In this case, if we sign him, he will join the club the next day and that will no longer be a player we're negotiating with. So these ones are a quick turnaround. So players from the youth squad do not cost any of the transfer budget, like I said, but they do cost the salary budget. So you can see there, this is going to cost us 87,500 in the salary budget. In the top right, you can see what we've currently got. So it's going to take probably over half our current salary. And as you can see, it gives us an update. We've now only got 54,000 in the salary and 4.7 million as transfer budget. Now I've changed the settings so we get an update every single day within the transfer window. So I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit next, which will skip one day. And as you can see, we get a cutscene for Bajer joining the club. You don't always get these and you get different versions of this. But as you can see, we've now got a new message in the manager's office, so we'll go into that. And our new signer Bajer has joined the squad. You normally get a few notifications on the first of each month to say the budget's been updated, which players have been excelling in training. If you've sent scouts out, if they come back and found a player, you'll get a notification here. And other things such as injuries and suspensions. Now, while still in negotiations, we can look at our own team. And there are a number of things that you can do in here. So first of all, it will show you what a current market value is of your player, any release fee that they may have, you see on the right hand side. So if a team comes in and bids in 12.677 million for Arcas, we don't have a say in that. The bid will be accepted and it's then down to Arcas if he wants to sign for another club. When this player's current contract ends, if you flip over the next page, it shows you what their current contract is, so their annual salary, if they've got any sort of appearance, goal or win related bonuses. If they're a goalkeeper, they may have clean sheet in there. If we did have a bid in for one of our players on that left hand side where it says deal negotiator, it would have some information about the club that are putting in the offer, what transfer fee they've been offered and a host of other options. Now, if we highlight any player, we've got a few options here. Now we can renegotiate his contract and renew that. So we'll go into that now. You see our cast there. If you go in, he's now requesting 426,000. We've got a three year contract. Now, if we try and select more because he's of a certain age, we can't offer him more than three years. I believe you have to be a minimum of 25 years before you can offer four or five year contracts. We cut up his annual salary. Obviously more like he's gonna accept the contract or we could try and lower it. We've got less chance of succeeding, but it will increase our salary budget. If we're worried about losing the player, we could increase that release fee. And we could add any incentives such as makes an appearance, he gets a bit of money, if he scores a goal, or if the team wins, as you can see on the right hand side, that money will be paid out if he meets this criteria every match. Now we'll send that off to the player and his agent and they'll come back in a few days with their response. 
Now what you could also do is if you don't really want a player anymore, you can put them up for transfer. So if you go in this option here, you can select the transfer policy. As standard, it's normally set for open to offers. If you really don't want to lose a player, you can select refuse all. This just means if you were to normally get an offering for a player, you don't even see that. It just automatically refuses it. You don't get any notification. You could place this player on the transfer list, which increases the likelihood that someone will put in an offer for him. You could also place him on the loan list. Again, just more likely that someone will make a loan offer. Now you can have both of those selected or just one or the other. You can also check reasonable offers. Now I don't normally do this, but it means that you'll only really look at offers that are around about the market value or higher. Now I do have one little tip is that most players, in fact, nearly every single player does have a release fee in their contract. And specifically relating to PES 2021, every single player seems to want a release fee in their contract. I suppose that's realistic to real life. Now, if I went in to negotiate a contract and to try to remove the release fee altogether, the likelihood is that player will not accept it. Even if you upped the annual salary and added bonuses, they're very unlikely to accept the contract. They can do, it's just unlikely. Now, of course, that means you're a bit open to a team coming in and just agreeing their release fee. You don't have a say in it. And then if that player agrees to leave, you haven't got a choice. One thing I have found personally, and I've heard other people mention it as well, is if you select refuse all with a player that you really don't want to lose, it seems like the AI just does not make bids for that player, so you're not going to lose them on that release fee. Now, I've been playing this game for a few seasons, and key players that I don't want to lose, I always put in refuse all, unless I suddenly decide that I need to move them on or make some money. And I have not lost one single player to a release fee in this case. So I don't know if this is 100%, but I would recommend that if you don't want to lose players, hit that refuse all button there. Now you can also release players if you want to, but it does cost you some money and that depends on what contract they're on, you know, their salary, how many years they've got left. So I normally wouldn't recommend doing it because it does cost you. But if you really want to free up some space in your squad or you're just really sick of the sight of one of the players, you can release them. So I suppose the next thing to look at is actually signing players from other teams. The best way to do this is to go in advanced search and then there's a whole host of options that you can pick from. You could just hit search and it'll bring back every single player. You can search for a specific players via their name. You could select them by position. Maybe you want a youthful player or for them to have specific skills. And as you can see at the top, at the search results, before you even hit search, it'll tell you how many players will come up. And you can delete any of these. So I could say, actually, do you know what? I'm gonna remove that player skill. That suddenly jumps up to 1,175, that play in the second striker and center forward position between the ages of 15 and 21. Now, I personally, when I play Master League, I always go for youthful players. I try and get rid of some of the older players eventually, and I'll only buy players that are on the up and are very young. Now, the benefit of that is you can normally play a lower transfer fee. You you can make that player your own and you can improve that player over time which obviously increases their value as well and generally i suppose the negative of that is they're not the best player they can be at the moment so there is a little bit of a learning curve for them and your team may not see the benefits straight away so i search for that now the likelihood is i'm not going to be able to sign pedri at this stage now in my current master league career i actually managed to sign him and he's currently 91 rated unbelievable and obviously at the moment, I don't have much of a transfer budget. Let's ignore that for now. And let's just say we had a bit of a transfer budget and some salary and we're looking to sign a player. Now, here's Xerxes, one of the players I bought in my Master League career, one of the first players I bought actually. Now you can look through his overall rating, his current annual salary, what his market value is, but then also what his release fee is. So if I went in a bid for him 7.29 million, the club don't have a say, and then I can offer him a contract. Affection is the affection that he has with his club, so the higher that is, the less likely he is gonna leave, when his contract is gonna end, and if for some reason he's unavailable, so suspensions or injuries. So let's say I want to sign Xerxes. I've got a list of options, so I can just start transfer negotiations for a permanent signing. I can request a year or six month loan. I can add to listed players. So this is just a short list of players that you're interested in, but it doesn't actually do anything. And you can view them all in that listed player. So let's say we want to start transfer negotiations. Now this can be different in different PES games, but in PES 2021, you actually do negotiations with both the club and the player at the same time. Under negotiations with Bologna, as you can see, I'm currently offering 6.5 million. Let's say I add a selling on option of 10%. So if I ever sell the player, 10% of that transfer will go back to Bologna. And I also could select a player from my squad that I want to offer in a trade. 
as you can see from the director's comments below, it says they're not impressed with our terms so far. Now that's just an indication, it doesn't necessarily mean whether the transfer will go through or not, but in this case it's sort of advising that you may want to offer more money or better terms. And the same for the player on the right hand side, it's got what we're currently offering for that annual salary, the contract length, what release fee. Now the lower you have this release fee, the better, if you put it as zero or higher, it's less likely to go through. And same with the player contracts we saw earlier, you can offer incentives for this player. And as you can see, we've got a bit of a comment there saying, looks like we've rubbed up the player the wrong way by releasing his release fee. So what we'll do is we'll lower that, we'll up his salary and we'll accept that. Now in this case, it is giving me a warning because I don't have enough funds at the moment. It's not obviously going ahead at the moment. This is just negotiation. So I'm going to say yes for that. It won't actually allow you to make a transfer where you're going to go negatively into the budget. Now we've picked another player that does have a release fee of £575,550 and I've selected that as the transfer fee. So the club doesn't have a choice at this point. And what we'll do is we'll have the salary just below our salary budget cap at the moment to see if we can get this pushed through. Now if we go into listed players, any players that we've actually listed appear in there. So it's just a shortcut for you can save up a number of players that you may want to buy further down the line and you can just compare them all. Now you can obviously remove them from here as well. So I could select this player, remove from list and now I'll only have Pedri and Martinelli in there. If we go in other teams, this is any ongoing negotiations we have with other teams or other players. And as you can see, we're still waiting to hear back from Xerxes and Basha and their respective clubs. And the other option in here is scouring. So we'll have a look at that now. You can select up to three scouts. Now they can travel around the world for you or specific places, regions, and they will look for players based on your criteria and come back to you with a list for them. As you can see, there's already one set up here, but we'll create a new one. So we will enable this scout and what we can do, we can select certain positions. Now we can select a general area like a forward, midfield, defender, goalkeeper, or we can select bolster weak spots. And now I don't know how the computer actually looks at that in your squad in terms of what it thinks weak is. So I tend to focus on either specific or just select any position. Let's have a look at a forward. Now, if you do select position, then you can specify exactly what position in there. If you want to, you could just select forward or you could say, actually, I'm looking specifically for a right winger. Area is actually location. So do you want it to be in a certain country and it'll give you a list of them? or you could select a continent. Let's say in this example, I'm gonna focus on England with a right winger. Things to focus on, there's a few options here. So you could be looking at the overall rating, so just the best player you could in that position. Still developing, which is what I normally go for. So someone that is not on the decline. Utility play, I'm not 100% sure what that looks at. I think it may look at, yes, they're in that specific position, but they also can cover a number of positions. Or player skills, so someone that's actually got a number of skills already. And the last one is, do you want to look at your budget before deciding which players they're going to scout? I'm going to say ignore. Now, this means that I'll probably come out with players, at least some of them that I can't afford, but ones that I could add to my list and look at in the future. Now, what are the benefits of scouting? First of all, it may just find players that you would have never thought of actually buying, but any players that come back on that scouting list, you have a higher chance of signing than if they're not on the list. Now you can actually use this scouting instruction to be very specific and if there's a player you want to go for there is a bit of luck involved but say if I wanted to sign Mbappe I could select his position so centre forward I could focus on the region he's currently playing in which would be France in this case assuming he's still at PSG and in time it may be that he appears on that scouting list now it's not 100% certain but if he does it means that I can now negotiate with that player and that club a little bit more easily you can actually tailor your scout instructions to a player that you already know exists but you want to try to get him on that scouting list to make it a bit easier to sign him just a little tip there so we skipped ahead a few days and as you can see we've got some messages that there's been some update in negotiations the Xerxes deal has broken down however the Basha deal is able to go through if we agree to do so and there's also been some update in terms of contract negotiations that are put in for these players now what we can do is go back into negotiations and we'll start off with other teams first now, as you can see, Xerxes has broken down. Now, as soon as you've got that decline, you can't put in a bid in immediately. But even if you just skip ahead one day, you can then put in a new bid if you want to. And as you can see in this case, both Club and Basher have both accepted the bid outright. No negotiations, they've just accepted it. But a lot of the time you do get clubs and players coming back to say, okay, we're happy to deal with you, except we want a bit more of a transfer fee, or we may want a selling on fee. The player may say, I actually want a lower release fee. I want more money. I want a different contract length. I want more goal bonus. If I wanted to, I could renegotiate and alter the payment, the contract length, the salary, all of those things, send that back off to the club and the player the more times you do that the more likely it's going to fail but you can do that if you wish to now in this case we've hit lucky they've all come back they're happy with everything so we'll accept those terms again we get that warning just to make sure we're happy with that 
and what it will do is it will remove the transfer budget and the salary budget as you can see we're only left with 900 pound in the salary there and as you can see you've got another cutscene with the player joining you don't get this for every player that joins and as you can see we've also got a notification to say the scout's not having much luck at the moment that might have been for that one that we put very specific instructions for the more specific you are the less players they're likely to find and we've had a negotiation offer for Kandamir, one of our center backs so well let's have a look at that now They've offered £69,840, he's worth closer to 100000 so now it'll be up to us, do we want to just outright decline that? We could, we could say, nope, we're not happy with that, in negotiations, don't want that at all. We could try and renegotiate, so this is the screen you'll see for renegotiation, so obviously it looks very similar to the negotiation screen that you would normally see. If you want to, we can up the transfer fee, now you can only up this up to the release fee, so you can't ask for more than the actual release fee. And again, you could ask for a selling on option, or you could ask one of their players to be traded. Now, if I select the players to be traded, it will give me the option to select one of their players. I don't normally trade players, to be honest, but it gives you the option. It's lowered the, re the transfer fee to zero, probably because my player is worth a lot less than theirs. So, you know, really, they're not going to accept that. In this case, I'm actually not going to renegotiate. So I'm going to back out of that. So I'll press circle, go back in and we'll say, actually, do you know what? We're going to accept this. It will then update the transfer budget for you, depending on what they offered. And more often than not, when you sell a player, the salary budget will also increase because you're now not paying that player. Now, when we skip ahead, that player will leave the next day. We actually offered some of our players some new contracts. Arcas has actually accepted his. So we offered him 341,000, which is actually lower than his current annual salary. But he's got a few bonuses in there. His contract length is higher and the release fee remains the same. So in terms of Arcas, I'm going to accept this now. And in this case, because his contract's going to be lower, we'll get a little bit of money back in the salary budget. That is one trick you can use is try and offer contracts to your players on a fairly regular basis. You can only do it so much. But if you can get their contract a little bit lower, it may give you a bit of room to sign new players. However, Castledean wasn't too happy with his contract. He didn't outright decline it, but let's have a look to see what they want. So all they've asked for in this case is they're happy with the actual salary, which has remained at 283,000 is what we offered, but they're asking for a win bonus of 810 pound. Now, if they asked for an increased salary compared to what I offered, it would have the new amount in brackets next to the 283,000. But again, I think this is a fair deal. It's still lower than his current annual salary with a little bit of a bonus if the team wins. So again, in this case, we've actually got a bit of an increase in our salary budget by lowering his contract. Now, about the transfer budget and salary budget, let's have a look in a bit greater detail about that. So if we go into manager's office and then budget settings, you will see quite a few options in here in terms of how you get paid different bonuses and also how you pay out certain contract options. So on the left hand side is the type of income, gate receipts, obviously merchandise, season objectives. If you get far in a competition, how do you want to receive that? Do you want to receive it as a salary budget? So that'll obviously increase the amount you can offer contract wise, or do you want to receive it as a transfer budget, which will increase the actual money you can offer clubs for players. Now you can alter this at any time and it takes immediate effect. And this may change over time because the higher your club gets and the more competitions is entering or potentially winning, money can come through in different routes. And players over time may pick up certain fan favor bonuses, which is part of their team role. So you may find that certain superstars, different players, they're gonna bring in more money from the club. I suppose it's from like merchandise and different sales. Now the bottom one is actually how you pay contract options. So as we saw earlier, one of the players was accepting a win bonus. If we win and we have to pay that player 810 pound, for example, do we want to pay that out of the salary budget itself or do we want to pay out of the transfer budget? Now, in terms of advice, I would say it's a fine balance and it really depends on what current financial situation you're in. Now, if you've got plenty of spare salary, but you haven't got much of a transfer budget and you really want to sign a new player, maybe in the next window or two, you may want to say, okay, I want to receive all of these as transfer budgets. So that's going to increase the transfer budget and I'm going to pay any sort of contract option with the salary budget. So that means any outgoings is going to be in the salary. I've got plenty of salary. I'm not worried about that. I want all the incoming to be in the transfer budget, increase that money and hopefully you'll be able to sign a player. Now, obviously over time, that salary budget is going to get lower and lower because you're paying contracts with that and you're not getting any income into that salary i would say though at season ends when you start a new season normally you will get an influx of money both in your transfer kitty and your salary budget but how much actually that will be you don't know until that time so i think it's just finding a balance and you may have to change this several times and at the start of the game you might want to keep a sort of fairly even keel so you get money in different places and you may want to just pay the contract options with your transfer budget if you've got a fair kitty in there 
And just a bit of an update from the scout before, we did actually get some scout results in, so we'll have a look at that now. So back into scouting, and as you can see, these scouts now have got some players on the right-hand side. So these players are the ones that are being recommended. Now, if we pick one of these, so if we go on the um, no region specific one, we could alter the scouting, or we can have a look at the players that are being found. And we've got to list them here. So we can look through them as normal. This one looks pretty good. I mean, not in terms of stats, but he's 21 years old. We could say, okay, we're going to look to sign him now they're more likely going to succeed because they've been scouted. Maybe this player previously, you would have had to pay more money for and more salary. So if you were after this player, big bonus there. And one other thing to remember is there are transfer windows in this game as in real life. So the first transfer window that you will encounter is that from the very start of the season up until the 31st of August, you can sign players. It will then reopen on the 1st of January. It's open for a month and closes on the 31st of January. Now the deadline days are slightly different so what we can do in here is we can make negotiations for players. Let's have a quick look. So for example, we've received an offer for Dean. Let's just say we accept that outright. Now there are 12 hours left in the transfer window and for us to accept this will actually take two hours. So you've got a limited time and a limited number of negotiations you can do on the last day of the transfer window. As you can see, we've accepted that. The transfer budget has gone up along with the salary budget. We're now not paying that player. Gives us an update to say there's only 10 hours left in the transfer window. Now let's say we wanted to sign Martinelli, which we're not going to do, but let's just, for example, say we're going to try and sign him. So we're just putting an offer in just to see what it says. So again, this takes two hours, so that's going to take another two hours off, but you'll get a response straight away rather than normally have to wait a few days. So if we look at other teams, quite clearly he was going to decline it. You can also skip an hour if you want to, and either once you've skipped enough time or if you've negotiated and the hours have run out, or if you click next to skip it all, it will then end the transfer window. You can still make negotiations in between transfer windows, but if anything goes through, players will not leave or join the club until the transfer window is open. So in this case, it's in September now, if I signed a player or sold a player, that player would not join or leave until the January transfer window opens. And just discussing the budget report, one thing to keep an eye out for is the first of every month you will get a report saying the expenditures and incomes you've had that month. If you go manager's office and budget report, now this won't appear in the very first month that you play, but after September it will show. This month we've actually gained a little bit of money in both areas, both in transfer budget and salary budget. It is worthwhile coming here every month, especially the longer you progress in the game to see which areas that you're actually making money, which areas you might be losing money, and you can then adjust those budget settings we discussed earlier based on where you're gaining and losing. And if you do like your stats or a little bit more in-depth look, there are a few places you can look to see how your team's getting on. So one of the basics is in my team info and schedule, you will see what sort of matches you've got coming up over which days. You obviously can see the transfer windows, etc. If you actually click on a selected match, it will show you what other matches are playing that day. Or if it's a previous match, it'll show you the results on that day too. You can look at club performance. So within here, you can look at any sort of competitions that your club is in. So you can see we're currently in the championship and also the FA Cup, and you can look at both of these. So if I select the Skyvet championship, I can see in here, I can look, have a look at the standings. So where we are in the league. You can look at the goal and assist rankings. And once the season is complete, or that competition is complete rather, you can have a look at the individual titles and the team of the season that will show. You can also have a look at your play results in terms of how many games they've played, what goals have scored, assists, the average rating, any yellow or red cards. You can also filter by individual competitions. And because I've same games, the bottom two sections don't show, but normally you can have a look in there to see actual player stats based on games that you've played. You can have a look at the current month, the previous month, and the season as a whole. And in database, you can look at any competition, any team, and you can have a look at them more in depth. So for example, I could go into France, pick League One, and have a look at the current standings. I could go into Team Info and select a club. Let's say I want to have a look at Benfica. I can have a look at their game plan if I want. More importantly, probably have a look at their squad list. And this list acts as very similar. You can sort by different ranges. You can also select players and decide to sign them, add to lists, quest alone, etc. You can have a look at any sort of news in the transfer market and it gives you the latest and the biggest signings ongoing. You can have a look at individual titles such as world's best player or best player of a certain region. You've got team of the month here and as you can see we don't have any players in at the moment for September. And you can have a look at the club ranking. So you can see the top ranked clubs in the world. If you hit square it shows you where your team is currently at. I'm currently sitting at a lofty 526 in the world. Now this does have a bearing on signing, so if you're going to sign players that are currently playing for teams that are above you, you're probably less likely to sign them. If they're below you, you're more likely to sign them. 
So I've already provided a few tips as we've gone along in this video, but one key one I would recommend is when you make negotiations, use the loan option. For example, say I wanted to sign Takamoto here. He's currently worth 15.7 million and he's got a release fee of 17. Now I don't really have enough money at the moment to do that. So I could just go with a standard transfer negotiation and I could say, okay, well, I don't have enough money to offer what really they want, but I could say we'll offer 12.6. Maybe I could say we'll give you a 10% selling on fee and then I could negotiate the contract with the player as well. Now, chances are that's not going to go through. You can see there the director's comments, transfer fee is too low. They won't entertain such an offer. Now, it may go through, but the chances are pretty low. Or what you could do is get a loan. Now, you could just go for a standard loan and say, well, I'll get this player for a year or six months. They'll add to the squad and then later down the line, they'll go back to their club. Or you could say, I'm going to do a one year loan transfer and then say, but with an option to buy. Now the way loans work is depending obviously what time frame you select you'll get that player on loan you will pay a transfer fee which will be lower than a normal transfer fee. If you select option to buy as yes you can then also say what is the transfer fee you're going to pay if you want to take out that option to buy at some stage and also if you do decide to take up that transfer option how much salary will you pay that player. Now, what I could do is say, okay, well, we're going to offer this player pretty good wage that we can't afford at the moment, but in the future, we'll have more money. And we could also say, actually, we're going to increase the transfer fee that we're willing to pay in the future to say 16 and a half. Now, these two fees at the bottom, both the transfer and the salary, we won't actually have to pay until we activate that option to buy, assuming this goes through. Now, obviously, if we decide not to take up that option, that player will just return to his parent club once the loan ends. The top transfer fee, which is just for the loan itself, we have to pay this immediately. Now, just for example's sake, I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to pay the full whack, seven and a half million, which is a lot for loan. You know, I wouldn't normally pay that for this sort of player. But let's say we'll do that. As usual, we'll say, yes, we want to enter this transfer and we'll skip ahead to see what happens. And we've skipped ahead of time and we've got a notification that it's been successful. So good news. What we can do is we can accept this loan now. Now this will take out the seven and a half million out of the transfer fee, but it will not take any salary budget. You don't pay the salary budget of any players that are on loan. And in reverse, if players of yours go out on loan, you as the parent club have to pay their salary. We skipped ahead to the January transfer window and that loan has now officially gone through. Takamoto has joined the club. Now whilst players are on loan at your club, they will appear in other teams. And as you can see, the loan is ongoing until the 31st of December 2021 because it's a year long loan and he didn't join until today, the 1st of the 1st. Option to buy is on. It shows us the transfer fee that we have to pay and also the annual salary that we have to pay if we want to take up that option. Now, we don't have the transfer budget there at the moment or the salary, but if we did, what we could do is we could select that player. We could say sign. What we could do is click on this player at any point during that loan. As long as it's before the loan ends, we could click on this player. We could say sign. It would normally come up with a prompt to say, are you sure you want to sign this player? We would say yes. It would take the transfer and the salary budget and that player would go from being on loan to then being a permanent member of the team. Now, you can use this to great effect when you don't quite have the budget and sometimes you can actually get an easier negotiation and maybe get slightly lower transfer fee overall yes you may pay a loan fee but you may be able to pay a lower normal transfer fee the combined amount may be lower than what you can normally play not always but sometimes so some other tips when you're looking to sign a player and if you really are struggling offer them a high annual salary now you can't renegotiate their contract straight away but normally the next transfer window after that you can then renegotiate their contract and quite often they will be willing to drop their salary down to more what is suited to their current rating what we'll do now is we'll flick over to my current master league save to show you an example of that so Pedri was a player I signed using that loan method. So I signed him on loan for a massive loan fee. I believe it was around about 20 odd million. And then I believe the transfer fee to actually put it through permanently was around about 70, 80 million. But it was still lower than what his club wanted and what his release fee was. Now his annual salary, I paid a massive 26 million, nearly 27. Because we only officially signed him permanently a couple of months ago, we can't renegotiate that contract until July. But I have done that with many other players. So for example, my Martinelli. I signed him permanently, not through the loan route, but I did offer him a high annual salary. I think it was about six and a half, seven million just to get him on board with the club. The next opportunity, I believe it was about six months later after I signed him, I was able to renegotiate his contract. And as you can see, I've got it down to 4.1. So savings of around about two and a half million. In the extreme example of Pedri, I don't know what his salary will go down to, but I think I'm probably going to save at least 10 million maybe. 
and you can also use this with the release fee as well so when you're looking to sign a player lower that release fee they'll be happier with a low release fee and with a high contract then when you've got them on board you can then keep trying to renegotiate their contract they may decline a few times but if you keep at it and you find the right balance you may be able to save some money that way and like I've said previously, I much prefer going after younger players that are still on the incline because you can improve a lot of them quite quickly as long as you play them in a fair number of matches or you can even loan them out to other clubs so they get a decent amount of play time. This is Messi, a regen, who I'll move on to regens in a moment. His expected progress is the grey bar and his actual progress is the blue bar. So you can see the blue bar is higher because I've been playing him in a lot of games. He did go out on loan for six months as well. He's actually going to increase a lot quicker because of that. In short, just play those young players quite often and they will improve quite quickly. And speaking of regens, you will start seeing regens after your first season. Now what happens is at the end of every season, players will decide they're going to retire. And in the next transfer window, or then the one after, which is in January, they will appear as a regenerated character. They will look the same, they'll play in the same position, they'll have the same name. The only difference is they will be 16 years old, normally when they come through, and their stats will be lower than what they would have been when they retired. In my youth squad, we've had quite a few regens appear. Koscielny there, he is 77 overall rated. He is 17 years old because he's been in the youth team for a year now. He was regenerated last year. And you can see his stats aren't all that great compared to what he would have been when he was in his prime or just before he retired. But he's on the incline, he's young. Player stats normally will be in proportion of what they had. So the likes of Messi will have high dribbling stats, for example. You can see koscielny has got decent jump and physical contact. So you can sign these potential superstars and actually develop them past what they would have been in real life. So going back to Messi, I've had him since he was 16 years old. You can see his offensive awareness, his ball control dribbling type position. They're not as much as they were before he retired, but they're pretty close acceleration and balance are great but then some of his other stats are quite a bit lower but you can improve that over time with training like we've discussed earlier and one good way of making money is also through the regens i would recommend even if there's a player that's especially in youth squad because you don't have to pay a transfer fee if someone like koscielny is not a player you're really after have a look at his market value he's worth 40 million now if you sign him into the youth squad it will cost you about 1.3 in annual salary but what you can do is then put them up for loan and transfer quite often these players you'll get a loan offer in before a transfer first but those clubs will have to pay you to loan that player for six or 12 months and quite often with these players it'll be a substantial fee now Messi's a bit of an extreme case but I did loan him out for six months and that team was willing to pay me I believe it was 22 million for a year-long loan which I managed to renegotiate to shorten to a six-month loan and they still pay the 21 or 22 million so if you are running out of cash I would say once the regens start appearing get a couple of them in put them up for loan and sale, make some money that way. Now, the other benefit of that is if you do put them on loan, they'll come back and their stats will have improved somewhat. You can then decide whether you want to keep them, loan them out again, or maybe you want to permanently transfer them. But more importantly, just go out there and have fun, buy the players you want to play, play in the style that suits you best. Hopefully this guide will have offered you a few tips, some things that you may not have known before. And if you feel there's anything that I've missed or you want to contribute, drop it down in the comment below. And let's hope we get to see Master League soon in eFootball 2023.